Hello, everybody. This is Don Grusin. Uh, this is uh, AllStarMusicLessons.com, and I wanted to take you through a couple of things that have that I've learned to do over the years, over these many years, playing this beast. Um, I want to talk about composition. I want to talk about exercise. I want to talk about posture, as you see me slumping over the keyboard. I want to talk about uh, internal kind of well-being, uh, staying in the present time when you're playing. I want to talk about breathing a little bit. And the, but the first thing I want to get to, and I want to talk about my heroes, my all of my keyboard heroes, piano player heroes, and I have many of them, and, and I, I think they're worth listening to, these guys. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. The first thing I want to do is show you what I do when I approach the piano. And, and when I come to the piano in the morning or the afternoon, I, I want to see what's inside me. And so I will just, without thinking about it, start something like I'll do now. I, I haven't been thinking about what I would do. Um, and I'll play a, a little lick of some kind, a little line. a song if you don't think about it. And then some variations. Now, if, if something happens with your hands when you're coming to the keyboard, because you're, you know, it built into this, built into these hands are automatic finger memories, and we're we're cursed with them and we're blessed with them. So somebody says an F seventh, I go, I go, I play. Actually, I play an F ninth. What they say, F seven. The thing is, if that happens and you can't get away from the habit, the automatic finger memory habit that we all have. Then the thing to do is to do a little exercise. And I want to talk about exercises next, so hang around. So I want to show you some exercises that I, I try to remember to do. It's not important that you exercise every day, um, but it's, it's really a, this is really a handy thing to try to get a little more stretch in the fingers. You know, the stretch in the hands, though it comes from the length of the fingers, it also comes from this between the knuckles. So you see these guys with little tiny hands playing these huge intervals? It's because they've managed to increase the distance between the knuckles. So one of the exercises that I think came from a guy named Francis Cook in 1917, I think it's a book called Mastering the Scales and Arpeggios. It's an old classic that all you real piano students would know about. Uh, he says do the following. So you take, you play a chromatic line like this. And you play it a couple of times. And then you do this. You play C, G, C, G, C, G, C, G, C. But every finger has to play the next note. So the fourth finger has to play the G, third, second, and the thumb. And you do this. Then you do the next key because it's important to play in all the keys. And if you make a mistake, go back and get it until you get it right. Like I just did. And so forth. Play at a speed that you can accomplish all this. Don't play faster. Don't, don't try to get done with the exercise. And what happens is, after a while, you'll feel the fatigue in the muscles of your hand and your and your forearm that are really important that lead to being able to uh, get those fingers stretched out. And um, I've gone from an octave to a ninth, 
in, uh, I don't know, three or four years of doing this. And my fingering is horrible because I never learned. I, I took private when I was a kid, but I, I learned mostly on the street. So you'll note that while I, you'll see while I pl I'm playing that I'm making a lot of funny fingering moves. And you'll say, why would anybody play that way? It's just a matter of, of habit. And um, if it works, use it. That's my little hint for exercise. Don, uh, thanks for doing this video, first of all. My uh, pleasure. Very excited to have you. Yep. And uh, I just want to talk about uh, some of your influences on the piano. Uh, who are the, some, some of the people you, you strongly recommend listening to? And uh, uh, Well, let's start there. Well, all the classical guys first. You know, uh, uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi, you know, the guys. And, and what you get from listening to them is this really a big goal to try to get to because they're so fluent in both hands. And as far as the jazz guys are concerned, I think you should listen to Art Tatum. And then uh, Horace Silver and all those guys from that era, uh, Tommy Flanagan. Uh, the more recent guys, uh, my favorite, I guess I would have to say, is Joe Zawinul. Although I love Herbie and I love uh, Keith Jarrett, and there's some new guys on the block that I think are really terrific who live in Los Angeles. Uh, Otmaro Ruiz, who's from sure. Venezuela, and uh, Mitch Foreman, another stellar player who moved here from New York. So there's some really good guys. My brother, of course, influenced me because I was. Probably when I was tiny, tiny, he was practicing the piano, and I was I was absorbing some of that stuff unwittingly. So it's that old nature versus nurture thing. Uh -huh. um, I'd guess half and half because of my my father was a string quartet violin player, so classical player. So we learned a lot of music from him. He was a masterful musician, and Dave played before me. And then uh, if you lived in my house, you had to play the piano. If you were going to be a gruesome, you had to play the piano. So that's how that all kind of happened. Uh, now I'm listening more to guitar players and kind of single line players. Mm -hmm. Did you transcribe a lot of solos? I never did that once. Really? I, no. I, I used to try to emulate Oscar Peterson's lick, that, that one that starts in the high register and goes all the way to the bottom of the piano. It's kind of a funky lick that he that he played over and over again over the years. Uh, but no, I never, I never transcribed any solos. It just came. I guess. You play what you hear. You play what, hopefully, what's in here. Right. Try not to copy too much. I think it's a good idea to, to play and copy some of your heroes. Bill Evans, the chord changes and, and the whole touch that he had on the piano is so important uh, to me. So I did emulate that and I love his changes but I think there comes a time when you find your place and it's almost instinctive mm -hmm. and everybody does find their place you know
can play. It's, it has to do with where the next change is going to sit. E flat, D. And there's different kind of comfort level with it. take you through a little bit of a, a chord progression and I'll use the blues that's a little different than what you're used to doing um, because I want to introduce the concept of stretching out which chord changes you use in order to get from for example F7 on the blues you go to B flat 7 So like just those, let's just talk about those first two chords that are in the blues. So we might do something like, I'm, this is off the top of my head because I'm not sure how I would feel right now, but I might want to go chromatically, say from F, E, whatever that is, 7th, flat 5, E flat 7th, D 7th, A flat 7th, flat five and then G to B flat. So here we go. To the B flat and then to get back to the F again we might go to a, like an E11 Then I'd like a diminish back to seventh. So we go from the B flat to the E eleven over an E. It's, it's nasty when it's just sitting there, but it feels good after it resolves. Back to the F seventh. Then when we're gonna go turn around to get down to the C or to the G. Go to F E flat D seven uh, F sharp diminished G seven G six and seven. So it's a F sus back to the F again. So I'm going to play it. I'll play one time through, and I'll just take my chances and you you got to learn to take yours ways to go and uh, I would experiment by playing whatever chord you want after the F to get to the B flat. For example, you play it F7 and then you play that chord. Now if, go from that chord to find out how to how to weave your way down to get back So the idea is to not get stuck playing what you think has to be the, the only approach to this, this blues playing. In fact, it's true with, with playing chord changes for any songs. So uh, um, we might get back to this a little bit later on, uh, on another tune because I want to I play you some other stuff. So uh, try this thing. Try these alternate changes for uh, the blues and begin with that and any key will work you know I use F because it's it falls naturally on me so now I want to show you something that occurs to me all the time in the in the recording studio or outside or when I'm listening to other piano players and and the subject is why do we con why do we confine our chords and melodies to this little area in here of about five octaves you know on the piano <laughs> We, we 
we kind of stay in there because partly because maybe we have a keyboard at home and it's only got this many notes on it, 61 notes or whatever that is, or 76 notes instead of 88 notes all the way to the end. And the piano is such a beautiful beast that it can speak at any level. Now, you don't want to play a lot of cluster chords down here. That chord sounds good up here, but it doesn't sound good down there. So you, there are some rules about not, not, uh, not combining too many notes on the bottom end, whereas you can get by with that on the top. But, you know, you can, you can play all kind of tight cluster chords up in the top. And as you move down, you have to be careful of not having too many clusters. Even though they're ringing nicely up here. Not quite as open, and it sounds a little... It's not exactly the dissonance, but it's, it's not as comfortable as those kind of chords are upstairs. So, for example, if the guitar player is playing in this... Uh, is here the piano player the best place for him to play the keyboard player is not in that same register but to complement it by playing so we could kind of simulate that by using the uh, the pedals right the middle pedal this middle pedal it's really a lot of fun to use for a lot of reasons and and that also opens your brain to using more of the piano for example if I play C's and hold down that middle pedal these C's are going to ring through the piano but they won't they, it's not like holding the pedal down because I can get rid of that and I still have these guys ringing so it kind of opens your head to other other ways of, of doing music You hear the harmonics ring from having this held down. That means that the that the felts are off those strings, and you can play. And if you put the sustain pedal down, it tends to even open up that chord a lot more. So my my feeling lately is to try to find more. Uh, more sounds that come from outside this little area of these five octaves and it's it's really fun because it just opens your brain more and it also gives room to other instruments that you might be playing with you don't want to play where the soprano sax is playing you want to play around it you don't want to play right where the singer is playing unless the singer needs the notes to keep to stay in tune but you want to you want to find an experiment with different parts of the instrument because it's it's such a beautiful instrument I would say anything in the 80s by Joe Zavinal, anything in the 50s or 60s by Miles and Coltrane, um, because I think piano players learn sometimes more from hearing bands where the leader is not a piano player. If the leader is a piano player, you're tempted to go, oh, I guess I better play like that because that's successful and it sounds good. But in fact, I think what it might do is corrupt your own instinct for your own style a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I used to love the three sounds. Um, and I used to listen to a lot of R&B in the early days. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's some classical stuff. Michael Brecker did a project with Klaus Ogerman some years ago, which was seminal, I thought, in terms of a guy, a classical trained guy like Ogerman, writing a, 
a piece, a long piece, to which he said to Michael, play whatever you want, you know, and, it, and that melding of the classical tradition and Michael's uh, uh, improvisational chops, which are among the very best I've ever heard, um, that led to a great, that was a great record. Uh, I would listen to old modern jazz quartet records, uh, Quincy's stuff in the 70s, late 70s, Mellow Madness was a great record. Um, God, you can go on. Uh, I like the African guys. Uh, Yusu Ndur has some new product out that's just lovely. Uh, the Brazilians, uh, Caetano Veloso and Ivan Lins and Javon and Milton Nascimento and all those guys, they always add something to my knowledge whenever I hear them. And I hear, I listen to their music a lot and I'm always learning something that I, I didn't quite get before. Mm -hmm. uh, the Latino end of things, there are so many good players and singers uh, spending time in Cuba a few years ago with Frank Quintero. We, we were deluged by some unbelievably great musicians. Um, there's a band down there called Havana Ensemble, and um, there's, there's dozens of groups, of course, there. Uh, so I think you pick Latin American stuff, and you pick Caribbean stuff, and you pick African stuff, and you learn from the U.S. masters and the European classical tradition guys, and then also pick up stuff that you, you can hear from Asian culture, like the, the superb Kodo music and the... From Japan and and the uh, Erhu violin, that one string violin from China, and there's just so much to listen to, you know. And every time you absorb these new kinds of music, you tend to incorporate it almost unwittingly in your own playing and writing. As a jazz player, I learned to play the melody in the right hand and the chords in the left hand, and I got to thinking. All these guys that play like gospel music and that play R and B and now now hip hop are getting getting used to having a lot of stuff happen on the bottom end that's not typically traditional. And some years ago, uh, because I was hanging around Abraham Laboriel, the bass player, uh, we we had a band with Lee Rittenour and those guys, Ernie Watts, uh, Alex Acuna, called Friendship. And, and at that time, I, I was interested in trying to find out what can I do with his left hand besides just playing the chords. So, I, so for Abe, I wrote this song that makes use of the left hand. And I, I couldn't play it when I first wrote it because it's hard. And then finally, what happened as a result of writing the song, the left hand started coming together. So it's that thing, that's that song called Water Wings. It goes, uh, I'll just play a, a little piece of it. So anyway, I, I, I wrote it in with two purposes. One, I wanted to write the song for him, and the other, I wanted to see if I could get my left hand to work like a classical piano player's hand works, because they're not, they're not stultified and stopped by this convention of playing the chords in the left hand and the melody on the right. Um, another thing I, would, I started doing with the left hand, kind of influenced by stuff that pop music people were doing, including, uh, even including guys like David Foster, and other songwriters of pop music is that they started playing left hand lines that could play with the bass or or just just as a kind of tempo pulsing syncopated pulsing thing with the tempo so uh uh let's see an example would be uh What 
do with the right hand is I, I, pu I put the a note that makes sense in the chord and hold it down, and then with my with the other fingers on the right hand play the rhythm part. So here, an example. <laughs> So the melody's playing on the little finger and the second and the fourth finger and the and the chords are played in the middle part of these fingers in the upper parts of this hand and then the bass has kind of got almost a counter melody to it. can make little patterns by trying different ways of using rhythm on and part of your hands a melody in part of your hands and make the bass make the left hand move around a little bit more and uh, you've kind of invented a whole new way a whole new style of, of playing playing this keyboard um, so just try it see, see try something like that uh, maybe we'll make available at some point um, S some uh, written stuff that you might be able to get so that you can see what the notes are if you wanted to try to copy something like this. But the idea is just to go, kind of go for it and, and let the left hand free up from playing just the chords and free the melody hand from just playing the melody and uh, see what happens. A few years ago I wrote a, I wrote a piece um, that I wanted to have my bro my brother Dave play on. Um, that was uh, I play a syncopated part and he plays a little syncopated melody and I didn't want it to be in four four. I wanted it to be in six eight or twelve eight so that it had a had a different kind of more world maybe more African kind of feel to it. Um, uh, so I wrote this thing called uh, Road Town, which actually came from the name of the of the capital city of the island of Tortola in the, in the British Virgins. It's a beautiful place, uh, but don't go there. Leave the place alone. You know, it's like one of those pristine spots. And, and it occurred, because of being there, it occurred to me that, that uh, rhythm players from all over the world, including pan players from that part of the Caribbean and, and Bata guys from Cuba and the balafone players from West Africa and Ghana, all these guys, they all have a way of letting the time go on and not paying so much strict attention to the time and playing around the natural pulses that are inside, sort of a kind of a heartbeat sort of thing. So I, I started out by playing a pattern that he could play to and, and maybe we'll show a little bit more of that later in, the, in, the, uh, in this lesson. But here's a way of playing if you thought of six, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, this note is on four, so it's kind of like it would be a backbeat, almost like a snare backbeat. So we go. that way but but 
if you play with different time signatures, a lot of these things will occur to you naturally, partly because you've heard a lot of stuff like this, and partly because your fingers will get used to certain kinds of patterns. We talked about that earlier, about, about finger memory. Um, so then I wrote a little melody that goes with that, and I can't play both of them at the same time because it's why I wrote the duet for my brother, but it's uh, one, two, three, four, five. Ten, 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 ten. Five, six, one, two, three, four, five. And then we played a, a bridge. A lot of fun to do that with somebody else and so maybe an idea to, to explore these issues is to get together with somebody else it doesn't have to be a piano player necessarily um, I was blessed to have the piano player that I was doing with uh, in having Dave do it but there's a way to there's a way to develop this sensibility by writing just part of the part and playing that and then writing another part and have somebody else play it it could be a guitar player or a soprano sax or a singer even um, and while we're on this business of syncopation, um, I, I've got kind of a, I guess it's a system, and I don't know that I have it because I've been doing it for a long time, um, of where to put the beats when you're playing anything, where to put the stress points, and where to put the accents. Um, let me think of a, let me get a little song together and, uh, and play that for you, and I'll show you about this this question of, of uh, stress points and where the accent should be and how it makes it feel better. And I'll, I'll do that right now. This is a song I wrote for, uh, for an album that I did on GRP and, then, and we did it again for this uh, project called The Hang, which, which you ought to check out uh, with a lot of great players and singers. And uh, it's called Makosa Beat. And I got interested in Makosa Beat because I was hanging around some African bass mm -hmm. players and percussionists and uh, they were showing me there is actually a style from Mali called Makosa, M-A-K-O-S-S-A. -S -S -A. And so I wrote this song called Makosa Beat. Now it's not legitimately African, but it's inspired me to kind of play it and, and find out where the, uh, where, where the syncopation differences might be instead of just a regular jazz kind of thing, because I'm much more interested in in the big picture, including jazz, but the whole picture of world music, um, including African music and other places. So anyway, here's this is Maco this is the line on Makosa beat, and it's in four four one two three four. <laughs> Thank you. 
for me to play it without everybody being on the band, but the idea is to keep the pulse going and not going. This is basically the chord changes of the A section. B, E, A. Instead of playing it that way. keep the spirit of the rhythm going within you without actually counting or counting out loud or even counting the beats in your throat you can uh, you, you can you can start varying from it while the pulse is as strong as ever inside and if everybody's feeling that same way when you're playing with other people then it's uh, it's uh, like a heavenly experience when that when that happens um, I wanted to say something else about about this song and about the the rhythmic thing you know a lot of these rhythms that came from Mali and from West Africa who kind of migrated to the Caribbean and then there was rhythmic content going on in South America that also migrated to the Caribbean the Caribbean became kind of a clearinghouse for a lot of stuff that a lot of rhythmic patterns including reggae but reggae is just a kind of a newcomer to all this because there was like some traditional rhythmic things that were happening before um, and uh, the balafon that led to the makosa beat this song and uh, and the syncopation that's played so it, it I'm, what I'm getting to is there's kind of a Latin Brazilian world music African kind of combination in music that we're all starting to take advantage of because it's all so uh, it feels so good and it's different than it's different than the usual kind of straight ahead jazz kind of thing that people including myself have done over the years um, so I think basically the bottom line of this segment is to, to, to encourage you to keep the rhythm going inside without having to express it exactly on the, on the, on the keyboard so that, so that the pulse continues and you can play all around. Sounds like you. Sounds like the left hand is going. Where is that left hand going? He's not playing in the rhythmic structure, but that's the charm of this whole kind of music. And uh, so I encourage you to check all that stuff out. And there are many players that that do this, and uh, lots of records out there. Voicing, um, which is about where you put the notes in the chord, really, or where how you orchestrate or how you write string parts and basically you learn all this stuff from playing this this guy um, I used to play the seventh on the top and then I got wait a minute that sounds so cluttered and so forth so then I used to, then I'd play uh, Play the seventh on the on the bottom. Depends on 
what's happening with the, the melody, of course. And then I thought, well, it's just, instead of just the basic C7, what about another way of playing it? So I've added another note to it, the chord, which is this ninth. And then I have the seventh, and I have the third, and the dominant. Now that's a real, for me, that's kind of a pretty change. And it's got, I like to play a lot of notes close together, as you can see. Uh, here's, a, here's a chord that's got a F, G, A flat, C, D. F, so it'd be a, it'd be a D minor flat five, or it'd be a F minor chord, F minor six chord, and the existence of these three notes together, you don't want to leave them there for the whole time. You want to resolve all the stuff that's slightly dissonant. So sevenths, sevenths can be played in so many different ways without just relying on which, what we learned in the very beginning. There, there's an appropriate time when you play that chord, but you don't have to always play it. And so I play, I try to find new harmonic combinations by just playing all over the keyboard. It sounds beautiful in this big old piano, doesn't it? Voicing the seventh. And then the flat five, I use a lot to go to the next change. That F sharp tells the tells the listener it's gonna be going somewhere. And usually, I think it would go logically here. Not necessarily. And I've gotten used to playing a lot of, a lot of uh, diminished and half diminished changes to get to the next chord. a little exercise. Find four notes down here. Maybe it doesn't matter exactly what they are actually. So start with these notes and then change one of the notes. That doesn't work. Change another one of the notes. That works. And then change another note. That works. That works if it's going somewhere. That changes that note. Just find four notes and keep varying 
their combinations and you'll find all kind of things happen. In fact, a lot of songs are written that way. Jobim, for example, writes... Uh, what's that name of that tune? And he plays... It just opens up your brain to all the alternatives without having to realize exactly which notes, the names of those notes. You don't have to know the names of these notes to, to hear the difference. do these little things to, to start a song and it's a it can be a really nice introduction just using three or four of these notes. So voicing is is in the eye ear of the beholder but uh, there's so many alternatives and it's it's an infinite number of combinations of these guys and uh, so just play around with it. So we always have to talk about soloing and improvisation, and um, it's all so personal. Uh, but I wanted to give you an example of it. So here's here's a song that I wrote called "She Could Be Mine." You might even know this song because it's it's gotten plenty of radio, uh, and it's also on the Hang. Uh, but the melody goes. <laughs> chord changes it sounds like it's already improvised in some ways and that's maybe some of the charm of the song but uh, let me just play the first little phrase and show you different ways that you might want to solo on this thing so it's a C minor C minor 9 and then you're going to go down to this A raised fifth which is going to resolve an A flat major 7th to the G, the augmented G. So maybe you might want to go, uh, you might think of it as play the melody or you might want to go take it out a little bit. Now, when I th I don't think about improvising. I don't it doesn't go through my head that I should play an F sharp or an A flat. I just feel like I want it to have integrity with the chord change, which for me is the most important and maybe only rule about improvising. So I shouldn't play because this is a minor. So I shouldn't play the major. So the E's pretty much out for the whole thing. And unless I want, wanted to use the E as a, a note to go into some kind of... Kind of, of the blues sort of nature. So 
we might play a thing like this. And then maybe play that again, but in a slightly different form, so as not to just repeat it, but to to act as though that first part of the solo was the platform for the next part of the solo. So let, let me try that again from the beginning, and then I'll play the second second phrase. phrase so I was playing then I played earlier so maybe this time I want to go not entirely the same thing but still has a connection to the previous phrase so improvising without calculating is kind of the idea but you don't want to just leave the listener listening to a whole bunch of licks up and down the keyboard like you hear all the time chop city and just kind of all kind of notes just to impress because the whole point of imp improvising is to enhance the melody that you heard before and to build let the chords have a huge kind of part in the play because they're the reason for why you're where you're at in the song and uh, so it, it has to do mostly with allowing the thing to breathe. And for me, I rid my mind of thoughts. I don't, I can't think about it. I have to let my, my whatever this musical sense that we, that we have as piano players come out and uh, into, the, into the picture and, and take over. <laughs> that E again. And then the end of the solo should be an ending of the solo. It should be it should be almost like a new melody that uh, you wanna you wanna finish it. Put a little capstone on it. So I guess my, my best advice is to rid your mind, stay true to the chord changes, and then the rest is totally up to you. This is a little segment about what you do physically when you're sitting here at this beautiful instrument. Um, first of all, don't act like Bill Evans. I mean, you just really don't need to lean over like this. It may give you some emotional something but what it's going to do in the long run is really screw up your back so try to sit up straight and try to keep your feet on the floor and feel free to tap your feet don't don't pay attention to those people that say don't tap your feet tap your feet if it helps you the other thing is is learn to breathe and I, I've been learning to breathe for so long and I still make the mistake of when I'm getting in a difficult passage for example I go <laughs> And I'm breathing in and holding my breath until I get to the easy part. Oh, yeah. And so the idea is to, is to allow your breath to happen no matter what it is you're doing. And, and it's very difficult if you're stuck in holding your breath to get through a certain period. And then letting it out. Then taking another breath. I do, I still do it. 
But I'll tell you, if I learn to breathe naturally while I'm doing this, it makes the music better and it makes it go faster. It makes the, the transitions happen faster because I'm not holding my breath waiting for some difficult kind of uh, uh, passage to be finished with. So the idea, sit, relax, keep your back up, pull your shoulders back, attack the piano, and breathe. Okay, just try it. This is Don Grusin, uh, and I hope you've gained something from what I've uh, talked about in this uh, allstarmusiclessons.com, and I, and I uh, just tell all your friends uh, to, to get this thing and look at it. Uh, there's some important stuff going on. And I want to do a little promo for my, my big record called The Hang. It's also a DVD, which uh, we included a lot of great people, including my brother Dave and Patty Austin and... Lee Rettenauer and Harvey Mason and all those guys that are, you know, the giants. Um, and I want to end with just playing some stuff on this piano uh, without any idea. I'm just going to start improvising. And uh, that's pretty much the name of this master class is improvisation. So enjoy. <laughs> Thank you.